Thanks for joining us in part one of a three-part series about caring for your skin. Now we're going to be joined by three medical doctors who will answer the tough questions from learning about skin cancers to cosmetic procedures. Doctor, something that you and I were, were talking about when we want to discuss is the fact that so many lotions and creams and serums, they promise this miracle cure, and we can go to a, you know any drugstore counter um, to getting a prescription for some of these. What's an active ingredient that works, or do, do any of these have active ingredients that actually will do something like that? Well, you know, that's a really good question, because most ingredients, 99% of all these ingredients don't really do much. They're, they're nice, they come in a nice package, so 99% of everything you buy at a department store doesn't really help your skin. They're moisturizers, Maybe by moisturizing the effect, they help some fine wrinkles. If you really want to get down to active ingredients, it's not antioxidants, it's not the moisturizers, it's not all this stuff. It is really the ingredient in Retin-A, which is a prescription drug called tretinoin. Right. Um, that drug has been, there's a lot of scientific studies to show that it does improve wrinkle lines, helps the blotchiness. Some of the bleaching creams work, although they are only low concentrations in the over-the-counter. Um, the DNA repair enzyme cream that's in our line does mm -hmm. help repair actual DNA damage and can help treat precancers and, of course, help wrinkle lines and, and thicken the skin. Uh, but then there's a whole bunch of new ingredients that you may not be aware of, yeah. ingredients like growth factors. Growth factors can thicken the skin. And a lot of the aging that we get is from that thinning skin, like, you know, around my eyes, you could probably see it's starting to thin and get wrinkled around the back of my hands. And why does that happen normally? Well, we, we, we have less DNA repair enzymes as we get older. We have less growth factors as we get older. Um, we get damaged, and so the collagen thins out. So those are some of the reasons. And, and that thinning occurs with age, and then some of it's hormonal. So a woman who's postmenopausal, who doesn't have estrogens, that reason get, gets thinner. So, you know, growth factors, loss of collagen, they all sort of impact on each other. That's why we get thinning, and then thinning does lead to wrinkles. And then that thinning look sometimes, you know, makes us look older, too. Yeah. Um, but I think growth factors is a new area of ing active ingredients. Um, stem cells. There's probably more stem cells in the skin than anywhere else. Hmm. So we can activate those with certain growth factors, stimulate them. You, that also can rejuvenate skin. Um, and, there's, and there's a variety of new things, you know, some peptides and a variety of uh, other ingredients. But... For the most part, the antioxidants, which we've talked about for years now, has not shown to work at all. Whether you take oral antioxidants by pills, you know, beta carotene, vitamin E, vitamin C, it has not shown to prevent cancer or slow down aging. And the same topically, you know, the clinical, there's very little evidence. There's some evidence in test tube work and evidence in animals, but actual human clinical studies has not shown to, you know, in any large studies, good studies, to really show that any of the topical antioxidants work, which really, you know, sort of tells you that you know almost everything that's available is really sort of hope in a bottle it's fancy packaging but not really helpful in terms of making the skin look better so the products whether it's an eighty dollar bottle of a night cream versus a five dollar jar of a night cream same kind of ingredients or how does that really yeah often they are I mean I would say that if you wanted to look at some inexpensive ingredients that do work I think you know, you can get the prescription one we talked about, Retin-A or Tretinoin, but right. there are retinols. Retinols do work, so some of the retinol products that are made by some of the least, less expensive companies, like Neutrogena, for example, right. that, that's very, that can be effective. Okay. Uh, some of the exfoliating agents, maybe with a little bit of salicylic acid or lactic acid, they can help a little bit, although, you know, we've gotten away from peels. We don't use much peels in our regular practice now. We've, Why is that? Um, they don't seem to really help wrinkle lines. I think they exfoliate skin. They may help some bleaching and blotchiness, but they don't do what we thought it would do, which is to thicken the skin and help the wrinkle lines as much. So although I've written books on glycolic acid and was really an advocate 25 years ago, 20 years ago, rare I haven't done a glycolic acid peel in my office for ages, and because the technology is improving. You know, right. One of the reasons that medicine is so expensive is we now have expensive technology, which in our field is you know, expensive lasers. 
talking about, I want to talk about the lasers also, talking about the, about the creams and, and so forth, when you talk about maybe being 16, 17 years old, wh what should a regimen be for a, a girl or a boy as far as keeping their skin clean and should you start using certain products that early versus later on in life? Now that's a great question because I don't, you don't, usually don't get that and people don't think to start using creams at 16 or 17, but you're right, that's of course a time when you use a good broad spectrum sunscreen. And that's a little confusing now because the FDA has sort of backed away from enforcing it till the end of the year. But by the end of the year, if you use a broad spectrum sunscreen, that means it blocks UVA, and that's a great thing for any 16, 17 year old, or even younger right. to be using. And then at nighttime, if you were to start really repairing sun damage, say you're picking a 16 or 17 year old that gets a lot of sun, then I would use the acne drug, tretinoin, which is also FDA approved for photo aging or sun damage. Okay. I would use that every so often because it helps acne and it helps sun damage. I would use our DNA um, repair enzymes because even at that age you're getting DNA damage and you can repair that. Um, DNA repair enzymes even repair a sunburn within hours. So any DNA damage can be repaired quickly. So I would you know, alternate those because most people can't tolerate the tretinoin more than two times a week. They get peeling and exfoliation. I think those are the two best things to use um, at, at an early age and maybe you know, both preventatively, keeping the skin looking good. And in fact, I have examples in my practice. I've been in practice 30 years. Mm -hmm. And the people, the, the women that I see who've used tretinoin regularly always have the best skin. So convincing that, you know, I started using it early in my life. And in fact, I have an example that I use in lectures sometimes of a woman who put it all over her face, but, you know, didn't put it on her neck. And you can see a dramatic difference of where she used the Retin-A tretinoin and Renova and didn't use it on her neck. So it's, it's probably the number one drug to use topically or cosmeceutically. And then, of course, there's some other things that can be helpful. So it's really protecting the skin at an early age from the sun is really what we're doing. Well, from the sunscreen standpoint, it's protecting. Okay. And then from, you know, something to use at nighttime that actually repairs or regenerates some of the collagen, I do think it's um, tretinoin and DNA repair enzyme creams are the best. Okay. And then later on when you already have the wrinkles and it's setting in, what kind of products? This is where these come in. Is that right? I think that products can help once you get to the point where you have wrinkle lines. Mo this is more preventive and this can help some, but when you have deeper lines, that's when we're more likely to talk about procedures, whether it's injectables like fillers or you know, Botox disports or what we call neuromodulators, since there's about three different brands now, it's not just Botox. And then also laser resurfacing is maybe the most common thing to be done because we all get you know, sun damage and you can help lines and thicken skin through a variety of different laser procedures that, that heal very quickly nowadays. You know, some of them heal as quickly as three days and they're painless as opposed to some of the older um, types of lasers that people think about that are you know, were more uncomfortable or a longer healing period. And I think people don't know about lasers as well. I want to talk mm -hmm. about the ones that you utilize. Now when you do a laser, is that, does that take it away forever or how does that work? Well, we all age, so nothing takes away forever, unfortunately. <laughs> Come on, Doc. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that you know we can repair maybe a common you know scenario. Of somebody complains about some wrinkle lines around the eyes. Yes, we have lasers that can heal basically over a weekend, three days, painless, doesn't require any shots. It maybe it's like a bad sunburn reaction, and it's great for removing fine lines, brown spots, blotchiness. We even use it from a medical standpoint. It prevents a lot of these keratoses and skin cancers. So I think that you know resurfacing your skin has a number of benefits, and maybe the most natural way of looking. People, you know, talk about unnatural, the looks of plastic surgery, you know, being pulled too tight can, doesn't always make you look younger. Right. Putting too much uh, volume in your lips can sometimes look unnatural. You know, having the old eye jobs where we would take all the fat out and you look gaunt or where it pulls down on your eye and you can see too much of the whites of their eyes or people who are pulled, you know, up too tight. Those are the things that people are always afraid of. And, and every day everybody says, well, well, doctor, just make sure it looks natural. That's probably the <laughs> yeah. most, one of the most common things I hear every day. Give me more Botox, but make sure it looks natural, right? Exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's a common. <laughs> now, for the lasers themselves, is it under the eye, on the forehead? Where is it on the face that people, that you would usually do a laser treatment? Well, the most common thing is actually laser entire face. You know, okay. people do have more wrinkles around the eyes and the mouth. So there are some people who do that, but I think more commonly, when somebody decides to do it, they do the entire face because we do have, you know, blotchiness and things that creeps up all over the place. Is it multiple treatments? How many does it usually take? Well, most of the, the, the laser that heals in seven days is the, the one called the carbon dioxide laser. Fractional carbon dioxide laser is the new technology. And that usually is one-time treatment, but it's seven days of healing. Okay. The newer laser that we probably do the most of in our practice that's even more common than any of the injectables now is called a fractional erbium. Mm -hmm. And it, just by word of mouth, people are really happy because it's painless it's fast healing 
and it does do a lot of good in terms of the wrinkle lines. Some people, one scientific study even showed that around the eyes, it was equal to the big laser, the, the CO2 laser. It may not be as good around the mouth, though. So it depends how deep the wrinkle lines are. If it's somebody's on the older side, I might recommend the fractional CO2. But if they're on the younger side, I might recommend the fractional erbium or the three-day healing laser. And when did you first find out about the lasers, and when did they kind of come into being used? Well, the first laser that I used was when I was actually a resident at UCLA, so in 1985. That was the first laser that just hit birthmarks, red birthmarks. Okay. And that, that discovery now is actually the most quoted paper in our field. May even win that person who discovered that, you know, some big prize. But that was the, the advent. It was really a simple concept, just that you could target, you know, red blood vessels or, you know, hair. We can, we can remove hair. We can target wrinkles. We can target blood vessels. We can target tattoos. We can target brown pigment. And basically that idea was that you could have the right wavelength, the right pulse duration, and target specific things without damaging your other skin, and that was right. And so now all these lasers have been developed, and you know, it's a whole big, whole big specialty. Right, and, and I guess people don't do facelifts as much because there are so many other uh, ways to take lines away or make your appear to look younger. I mean, we still do facelifts, you're, but you're right, we do less. And we do less because there are ways to tighten the skin with radio frequency devices that tighten to a modest degree. We are better about taking care of our skin using these creams, the thickened skin, you know, tightening around the jowls that are as good as some of the procedure-oriented procedures because if you thicken the skin along the neck and along the jowl area, it actually tightens the skin. And so their jowls are improved by using these type of growth factor creams. So I, I think you're right, there's less. And then a lot of times people used to think that you know, you're sagging, but it isn't always sagging. Sometimes it's the loss of volume, like I'm losing some of my cheek fat, and that causes more drooping. But if you can replace some of the volume, then, you know, that picks everything up. It also looks um, better. You know, as we look older, or as we get older looking, it's sometimes that gaunt look, which is sometimes why a really thin person can look older. Mm -hmm. A heavier person, you may not want the extra weight on your body, right. but a heavier person on their face looks young. So how does it work to actually thicken your skin? How does he... Well, the growth factor is uh, among the many things that we have less of. You know, we have less of certain hormones. Well, we le have less of epidermal growth factor. So that causes the thickening of the collagen. If we have less of it, we can replace it with this human epidermal growth factor that is bioengineered. It's in the cream. We put a little bit of that on, and that can thicken the skin, as does tretinoin, retin-A. They also thicken the skin, too, mm -hmm. as does laser resurfacing. All those things thicken the skin as does some of the injectables like Sculptra is another one that thickens the skin. Okay, so show, show us your products and how they're used. Well, I think the most important thing in terms of a health benefit is DNA repair enzyme creams because we all get sun damage. Or you and I growing up in California, yes. <laughs> you know, playing a lot of tennis, doing all these things. And the best products for that is to repair that with DNA repair enzymes. Since we have less than that as we get older, these two products actually repair DNA. You know, the, the Nobel Prize was awarded in 1953 to Watson and Crick, who discovered the triple helix. Those little molecular structure actually gets damaged by sunlight, gets damaged by pollution, it can be damaged by chemicals. We all have enzymes that repair that, but we have less and less. There are actually studies to show that in a syndrome of, of kids who are born without DNA repair enzymes, this exact formula actually, put it on their skin, can repair them so they have less basal cell carcinomas, less melanomas, less oh. precancers by, by it working. Now as a side result of using this, not only does it repair your DNA, it makes your skin look better because mm -hmm. it thickens it and it, um, you know, repair, it prevents sunspots or, you know, removes some of the spuns, sunspots or blotchiness. So these are probably the most important things. Maybe I should even qualify. The most important thing is to prevent sun damage is to use a good sunscreen. Mm -hmm. So this happens to be one that lasts longer than three hours. It's greater than 30. There's other great sunscreens out there, as you know, though. And, you know, we, as dermatologists, we often recommend inexpensive brands, even like Neutrogena, Vino, things like that. But um, that's, that's probably protection. And then along the same lines, there's DNA repair enzymes in the eye. The only the difference around the eyes, we have some moisturizers and some peptides that stop some of the wrinkle, wrinkle lines a little bit and moisturize with beta-glucan. So that's a slight difference in the formula there. And then finally, we talked about skin thickening. So much of, of, of looking younger is thickening the skin, whether it's all these things. And this is the growth factor serum. That's, it's a human epidermal growth factor derived from Iceland because there they bioengineer it from barley since they grow everything in um, greenhouses as opposed to here we make every, all our bioengineered products from E. coli, which is a bacteria. So those are, that's really the line. In addition, there's a cleanser, and there's a scar cream, and then this is a traveling kit. 
Interesting. Well, I know when you put all this together, you must have done a lot of research to find out which products you like specifically. Yeah, this really resulted from research. The real reason um, that we started doing this is to prevent cancer. So our, we, we have a part of our practice, the skin cancer practice. We right. prevent cancers by using these type of things. We treat their actinic keratosis by using this. Their skin looks better, but also it actually is preventative in a sense. So using these products is helpful, and, and that's how I really got into it is my, um, I had NIH grants for skin cancer. I was interested in preventing cancer, and then of course I treat cancer surgically. So it sort of goes in line. The cosmetic is really the side benefit. Right. However, that is the bigger market, and yes. people buy it more <laughs> for cosmetic benefits than they do for prevention. What do you think is the biggest misconception or mistake that people make about their skin? I think that as young people, it's that we, uh, we think we can get away with a lot of things, so people go into the sun. And um, I, as president of the Academy of Dermatology last year, I was made the FDA announcement about these new sunscreens. So I'm sitting on, you know, in front of the big three, state, uh, three networks, and I didn't realize how smart Diane Sawyer was. So I'm going along <laughs> the first two, and I'm doing okay, and they asked me about you know, something about SPS or something. And then Diane Sawyer says, well, why didn't the FDA make a ruling and, and enforce this you know, for the public over the last 35 years? I didn't know what to say because I, you know, I started sweating, perspiring. The FDA officials behind me, and we wanted to <laughs> look good in front of the FDA, so I sort of passed that off. But the other, the other is what you just alluded to, and that is if you don't use the right sunscreens, are you, are you really getting a false sense of security? She, I think her question was more like, is that the reason we've had such an increase in skin cancer, even though everybody's using sun, sunscreens? And I, and I don't remember how I answered there, but she's actually right. Um, she, we may be sitting outside putting the, a bad sunscreen on, blocks the UVB, but it doesn't block the UVA, that is not broad spectrum. And all the companies sort of lie and cheat right now until, mm -hmm. until the end of this year when they're going to be enforced, and then broad spectrum will mean broad spectrum. Um, we may sort of go out there thinking that, yeah, we're, we're protected and we're not. You know, it's as simple as going to the tanning parlors, which is all UVA, and, right. and, and I think you know that fi um, uh, one third of all young women between the ages of 15 and 30 now regularly go to tanning parlors, which increases your melanoma risk by 75%. And we are seeing many more uh, melanomas in young women because of that. So we need to change that. And you know, it's an addictive behavior. People right. even get endorphins from lying out in the sun or going to these tanning parlors. It's a behavior that started you know, with Coco Chanel, but needs to be changed because we are seeing more melanomas, more deaths from melanoma. Um, maybe that, out of all the things you asked me, that's probably the most important thing from a public health standpoint. Right. Not only that, are you seeing more uh, facially than more skin cancers on the face now as well? Or yeah. Well, I mean, the ones people who go to tanning parlors, of course, they can get it. They, they're anywhere. they're all over. Yeah, anywhere. Right. But we do, and a lot of the aging we're talking about is from the sun too. The right. long wavelength light causes a lot of this um, thinning of the skin and causes the brown spots, and so you know people will look better. You know, we we as dermatologists and as president of the Academy of Dermatology, we were trying to think maybe we get through to these young girls by saying, not worried about the, that they're gonna get melanoma, but that they'll look really ugly <laughs> and have lots of wrinkle lines that may be more convincing to them. We're not sure. Talking about different kinds of skin, can the same kind of products be used or do you have to change them up a little bit? It's a good question because everybody always wanted, to, do you need you know, different products for different skin? In, in most people, you know, the difference between your skin and my skin, no, you use the same products. You use one for protection, a sunscreen, use a, a product to prevent wrinkles or to treat wrinkles and it's really the same. However, you know, somebody who has fair skin or lighter skin like you compared to myself, you may get some of these spottiness earlier or I may be more likely to get blotchiness instead of the, the wrinkles or, you know, there are some differences but we basically treat it the same which is, you know, tretinoin, DNA repair enzymes, growth factors, some of these newer things or we use lasers and resurfacing techniques. When somebody comes to you and, and they want, they don't know if they want lasers, they don't know what, what kind of procedures they're going to need, how do you sort of go about that and assess it? Uh, I try to, to summarize them in three different categories. Resurfacing procedures, which I think we dealt with most of them in, in talking about it. Yeah. Um, tightening procedures, which everybody knows is the facelift, yeah. but we also have non-invasive ways to tighten. Okay. And then the final thing is the fillers, which I think people are starting to recognize sometimes that it's not just filling, people used to think of just filling around laugh lines, that doesn't really make you look younger. It just makes your face sometimes look full. Yeah, fuller, yeah. we even call it the simian look. If it looks, it sometimes can look somewhat like ape-like if you put too much fillers here. Right. So really it's fillers in some of these areas like the mid-face, cheeks, in the volume round that looks that makes us look gaunt. Those are the areas or around the eyes where we 
think we're, we have bags under the eyes. That's a common thing I hear every day. I, the bags in the eyes are bothering me, but really it's the loss of fat in what's called the teardrop deformity, uh -huh. or sometimes people call it the peanut look, where they, they lose some fat in this temple area. So putting fat up here actually replaces that and makes them look younger. So some of these volume effects, so resurfacing, volume things or, or filler type things, and then um, tightening procedures are the three things we do. And generally, you know, it's, it's actually patients and I usually agree pretty quickly what is the most important if you had to rank things in priority. Or some people need all three, and, you know, that's not uncommon either. Right. Well, of course, everyone in Southern California, youth is a very important thing here. Everybody wants to look younger, but I guess the preventative is the most important thing to stay away from the sun and prevent skin cancer as much as possible. What about... Um, as far as eating and drinking, I know water is very good to hydrate your, you know, your body and your skin. I'm sure you talk about the nutritional. Yeah, the nutrition is very important, and we 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 use that as part of our practice, and that is, you know, treating from the inside out. So right. I think that, you know, eating well. Not that I didn't mean to say antioxidants are bad necessarily. I more or less said there's no proof that they really do a lot. Right. But there is proof that eating fruits and vegetables, eating antioxidants naturally prevents cancer, slow down aging, and I think that's very important. We need to eat well. We don't need to be eating poorly. Right. Um, we think that, you know, some of the hormonal things that matter, you know, things like bioidentical hormones that you know, maybe are not in the mainstream, have a lot of potential. We know stem cells is the answer to a lot of diseases, but we, you know, we inject it as co doing cosmetic um, medicine. We actually use stem cells when we're injecting fat, and there's a, hmm. and we know that even in the last 20 years, when we inject fat into an area, the overlying skin looks better because some of those are stem cells. Some of the fat are stem cells. So um, stem cells, nutrition, as you say, I mean, sleeping well is probably one mm. of the most important things. Oh, yeah. These are all sort of common sense things, but they do play a role in making the skin look better. It's amazing when you think about it because everybody wants that quick fix, but it is sort of a lifetime process, isn't it? It is. I mean, I have patients um, who, you know, start who started these anti-aging treatments who were going to do a facelift or some cosmetic procedure with me, by starting the bioidentical hormones, by starting some of the anti-aging treatments, their elasticity and everything suddenly got better. They didn't even need the procedure. They looked Amazing. so much better. So if we forget that sometimes doing all these other things matters as much as any procedure, and this lady that I can think of actually decided not to do it, and I agree with her. She looks so good by doing all these other things. We are back talking about outpatient cosmetic procedures. From Botox to fillers, we'd all like to turn the clock back a few years. So which treatments work best and when can they become dangerous? Doctor, we're talking about different things, different procedures to what women and men do, of course, to look younger. Um, one of them being Botox, Restylane, fillers, collagen, all that kind of thing. We kind of want to break it down for people and talk about what each one does um, and, and how it kind of works in your system and all that good stuff. So let's start with Botox because that's one that we hear the most about. What, it, what does Botox do? Uh, Botox um, actually works on the muscles. Okay. So we call them muscles of facial expression, so the muscles used when you smile. Okay. When you raise your eyebrows, when you squint, um, <clears throat> and it can actually uh, chemically weaken those muscles is, is essentially the way it works. Um, as we use these these muscles over and over thousands of times a day, what happens is you're really compressing the skin, overlying the muscle. And over time, what happens in that in that compression area is, is you form a line, mm -hmm. you form a wrinkle. Okay. Um, so what the Botox will do is. Uh, it's, a, it's a simple injection in the skin. Okay. The chemical itself actually gets into the, the nerve endings that control that muscle, weakens the muscle, relaxes that muscle, so you're not really forcefully creating that line again. Now, if you do it repeatedly, will it eventually take the line away? Or Because I, I know it's a temporary sort of... That's the idea. Yeah, you're exactly right. So okay. these Botox injections will be active for about three months. Okay. And then uh, your body's able to basically wash that out. There's no more of that, that, the Botox left in the system. Everything is back to normal. Um, but during that period of time, with, the, with that muscle being relaxed or that tension going to a different area, 
uh, you are able to relax that, that line that was visible and, and in some cases even just make it go away completely. Okay. A lot of it really depends on how long that line has been there, okay. how deep that line is, how strong the muscles are and all these sorts of things. But you're right, some, for, for very fine lines it may be that just one injection is enough to soften and flatten the line. For people with deeper lines, it may take a few sessions or a few sequential injections to, to make that line fade away. Okay, and what is Botox? What actually is it? Well, as the name says, it's, it's <laughs> botulinum toxin, so okay. it, it's, it's actually um, has been uh, purified from, from a bacteria. Okay. You know, it's a bacteria that's found in nature that creates this, this toxin. Um, uh, although it's a toxin, it's really toxic to the system only at super high doses. So the amounts we're using are, are really thousands of times lower than anything that could be you know, dangerous to the system. Okay, and Diceport, is that another form of Botox or what, it is. what's the difference? Yeah, so there's actually now in the U.S. Um, three different botulinum toxin type A. Okay. There's Xeomin, uh, Dysport, and, and um, Botox Cosmetic. Do you prefer one of the, over the other? What's the biggest difference? Or you know, chemically they're they're nearly identical. They're, okay. As I said before, they're really they're synthesized, they're generated, they're created in a lab, and and you know to make them um, compatible and useful, there's very small uh, carrier molecules or uh, that are that are added to them. So there's the very subtle differences, but as far as effect goes. I think they're essentially equivalent when used in appropriate doses and, and, and proper injections. Is it a preference for the physicians or how do you decide which one to use on? Sometimes. Okay. Some people may have a preference depending on the area. Some okay. physicians may feel, that, say, around the eyes a particular product may work better. Some patients have a preference. Okay. Some patients who have tried both of the products may feel that one of them works better in their system than the other, um, you know, which is, is, I think, a valid statement so um, it may be that some people find that one works better for them. Okay why is it that when you do Botox it doesn't show up right away? Where does it go? What, it, what happens to it in that few days? It really has to do with the the science and the chemistry behind it. Um, <clears throat> the the nerves that control the muscles are uh, have uh, created and synthesized all the necessary molecules to make that that muscle work. Okay. The Botox goes into the into that nerve ending muscle system uh, very very quickly, but it takes a little time for it to actually have that effect to have that block. It's a chemical blockage that happens in there, so it has, sort of has to overcome uh, the part of the system that's already established and created. So there's a little delay. It's about five to seven days for that uh, for the Botox to, to fully kick in. Is it and different see the for everyone, or is it this about the same? Well, there's a bit of a range, but usually five to seven days is, is, is pretty normal for everybody. Okay. So typically what we'll tell patients after an injection is in a week, look in the mirror, go through your expressions and your exercises, and you should see that you know, they're softening. You're, you're trying to make this effort to squint or raise your eyebrows. It's just not happening as much as, as you would normally see. Okay. How do you know where on the face to put the Botox <coughs> versus a filler, which I also want to talk about as well? Mm -hmm. Where do you use what? Well, again, so Botox is, is used for the uh, facial expression muscles. Okay. So the most common area is here. Mm -hmm. Some people call it the 11th. Right. <laughs> um, but it, it's, it's called the glabella, and they're the muscles that really bring the eyebrows closer together. Um, other areas are forehead, mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. treating forehead lines and, and crow's feet. So these are the three most common areas. Okay. Um, and again, so these are areas where the muscles are functioning, making the lines. There are other areas, such as the nasolabial folds or smile lines, as some people call them. These are not created by muscle. They're created either by loss of fat or you know, loosening tissue, uh, loosening skin. So that's more appropriate for a filler. Really, fillers are meant to replace where we've lost fat or where we've lost volume in the face. Part of the aging process is, um, is loss of fat, loss of fat in the cheeks. We can lose fat along the, the jawline. We can lose fat under the eyes. We can lose fat through the temples. So anywhere where you've lost fat and, and you see a deepening or, or, or a crease forming, you can use a filler to essentially plump it back up to fill again. And are fillers the same things that you put in lips when lips are injected? Uh, lips is another area where, yes, yeah, so over time we tend to, to thin out. And what is in a filler? Is that the same, not the same thing obviously as Botox, so it would be something different? It's different. Um, and, and these days there's a wide range of different fillers. There's some that are meant to provide the immediate plumping or filling. Okay. Uh, the most common of these are hyaluronic acids like Restylane and Juvederm. 
Um, and uh, there are some that are injected to stimulate new collagen in your skin, so mm -hmm. providing sort of a delayed plumping or volumizing in the face. That could be Sculptra or Artifil, and there's, there's various ones there. Um, and we also oftentimes will use fat. So fat transfer, taking, for example, somewhere you don't want it, yeah, stomach, villa, handles, <laughs> outer thighs. Uh, so take where you don't want it, put it where you do need it. Do you find that when people come in, they obviously want to look younger, they want to look better. Do they exactly know what they want, or is it something where people come in and say, um, I want Botox, but is that what I need? Maybe I needed something else? Uh, some, people are, some people are very knowledgeable and savvy. Um, there's a lot of information, I think, in the media out there. Mm -hmm. So. Oftentimes people can be confused or, or get some misinformation or not necessarily know exactly what's right for them. So really the best way for people to self-analyze or, or uh, self-assess I think is just to look at maybe an area that they're not happy with or where they've noticed a change. Okay. And then you know our job, job as a professional is to really help you know, provide the, the suitable you know, remedy for that. I think also we've seen the cases where people sort of tend to over Botox or over fill. <laughs> right. And when you look at something like that, how do you kind of say, no, stop, let's not do this anymore? Or Right. I mean, I think the, the overall goal should always be to, to enhance one's natural self. Okay. And not to overdo it. Um, the, the human face, the human persona um, is beautiful based upon appropriate proportions and appropriate anatomical lines. For example, most people um, will want these lines filled, okay. but to overfill these is, is inappropriate right. because then we, we no longer look human, we no longer look natural, we no longer beautiful. You flatten this part of the face and you've lost definition in that area. Um, just as some people may perceive a thin lip to be beautiful. Some people may think a large lip is beautiful. So that becomes a, an issue of preference. Um, uh, thin cheeks or gaunt cheeks versus large cheeks. Now some of it's personal preference and some of it is again achieving the proportions. Do your cheeks match the rest of your face? Okay. Is the lower half of your face balanced with the upper half of your face or is something out of proportion? Out of Just as you can be asymmetric from one side to the next you may be out of balance from the lower part of your face to the upper part of your face. So everything should really fall into a natural proportion to really achieve that, that natural beauty. Something else people ask is, how much of this is dangerous? Is any of that dangerous to do on a regular basis? I don't think they're dangerous. I think these procedures are straightforward. I think they're simple. Um, they're are always potential complications with anything. They're injections, so right. obviously the needles need to be placed in appropriate places. Mm -hmm. um, you can have, for example, with fillers, if they're placed inappropriately, you mm -hmm. may wind up with a bump or nodule. Okay. Um, you, if you overfill, just as we discussed, right. it's not really a complication, but it's not the ideal outcome. Right. Um, so things must be balanced, things must be injected in appropriate places to achieve the appropriate results. Um, one, of the, one of the beauties of, of some of these fillers is, for example, the hyaluronic acids. Okay. So hyaluronic acid is a natural component of skin. So these fillers are based upon a natural component of skin. That's what gives our skin a little substance, a little sponginess, a, a, a little elasticity. The nice thing about these fillers, if too much is placed in an area, or it's out of balance, or there's a bump in the skin, there's actually, we actually have the ability to reverse that, to oh. dissolve that filler. Interesting. So that's one really nice thing for people to keep in mind. If, it's, if they're first time patients looking for a filler and they're hesitant about having it done, it's nice and comforting to know that you can actually reverse it. Okay, I think people also hear about the pain involved. How much pain is involved when you're doing something like this? Not much. There, there are always ways around that. Okay. <laughs> we, have, we have anesthetics in topical form or we have injections in, you know, for certain areas. Many of the fillers these days actually have an anesthetic built into them, okay. which makes it more comfortable. Mm -hmm. For the patient, ice packs, there's lots of ways to, to make a patient comfortable. Um, some areas are, are a lot more sensitive than others. Okay. The lips, for example. Right can be very sensitive, but cheeks and under eyes and, and, and forehead and so forth, it's, it's very easily tolerated.
You know, I read recently that Botox has been around for a long time, mm -hmm. but now in that maybe the past five to ten years, we hear hear a lot about it. But it's been around a while. Can you talk about that? Yeah, it's it, it's, um, it's been around. Uh, I think it just celebrated the tenth anniversary of the cosmetic. Okay. Um, but but even before that, you know, use in, um, in treating stiff necks and eye spasms and these types of things. So there's a long history. There's a very safe track record with it. Um, lots of research behind it and the development. Allergan, the company who um, you know, was first to develop it, has, has, has done a wonderful job as far as researching it and providing quality control. And, and, and um, in my mind, it's a wonderful medication. It's, it's, it's very, very safe. And when used appropriately, um, you know, any possibility of side effects should be really at an extreme minimum. Okay. And when you're, we're going to actually watch you actually inject somebody today. Right. When you're doing that, is it always the same places or does that change over time or how does that work? The basic injection points are the same. <clears throat> the, the true artistry, I think, comes in matching the dosing to the patient. Um, there are basic muscles that everybody has and those are the, the major targets for the Botox but you can tailor make the the treatment to an individual patient okay. some people have very small accessory muscles in the mid part of their face some people may have um, other areas where they develop lines okay. on the side of the nose we call them bunny lines from okay. when you squint <laughs> um, uh, sometimes even using Botox in, you know, in the upper lip for some of the, uh, the, the fine lines around the mouth some people may have very strong muscles around the eyes or very strong muscles in the middle part of the forehead, so the dosing needs to be adjusted just right for those, for those patients. Some people's eyes, they complain of drooping or... Right, so you can actually use Botox uh, in many patients to provide a little bit of a brow lift. Okay. Yeah, so it's another, um, another uh, fine you know, technical adjustment there okay. that you can do and, and really get a nice lift, a nice opening of the eyes. What about under your eye? Under eye, too sensitive or? Um, it's a little tricky. For some people, it's appropriate. A very, very tiny little dose right underneath the eye. Um, but that's a very small subset of patients. Too much Botox in that area really you can result in a in, in a droopy lower eyelid and some dryness in the eye. Okay. So that's something that needs to be used really only in, in very well trained hands and and only in the appropriate patient. Do doctors always perform the injections or do nurse practitioners do it? I mean, we see Botox parties and you see mm. women going in with full makeup on their face and it just doesn't seem clean or healthy or something. Right, obviously the, the environment's important, so you know, it's a sterile environment. It's, a, it's an injection through the skin, so so long as the skin surface is, is clean and all the instrumentation is sterile, then I think that's fine. Um, most of the injections are done by physicians, although there are nurse practitioners and, and physician's assistants, as you said, that, that have been trained to do the injections and I think are qualified to do the injections so long as they've had proper uh, training and experience. Okay, yeah, because that seems like a big thing. We see, we hear that all the time about these parties that they have at people's houses and I'm like, you're not going to a doctor's right. office? Wait a minute. <laughs> yeah, it certainly is not something I would recommend. Yeah. And, and, and truthfully, you know, there are many, probably many people out there who do these injections and, and perhaps, um, you know, are trained to, to a certain extent, but um, I would always advise people to look into the background and, and the training of, of anybody who is potentially injecting them. Yeah, maybe not with a glass of champagne. It's really not a Probably good not idea. Not. <laughs> Afterwards, okay. it's always fun. Aftercare, after the procedure. I usually have my patients ice afterwards okay. just to minimize any swelling at the injection points and prevent any bruising. Um, there's no bandaging, okay. so there's no bandages that we use, but we do ask that people refrain from um, you know, strenuous exercise or lying down for a period of several hours just because we don't want the, the substance, the liquid there that we've injected to migrate to other places. We really want it to stay right where we've injected it. Sometimes there's bumps. There'll be little tiny bumps because it, it is a liquid, a solution that we, we inject in there and you get a tiny bit of swelling just from the, the puncture. But that really dissipates and goes away in probably a matter of, of an hour, especially with some ice afterwards. Best thing to remember is, is um, to avoid any blood thinners or uh, mm. aspirin or ibuprofen, um, you know, any medical blood thinners, these types of things before, because it just increases your chance of maybe getting a little bruise at the injection site. Good information. Yeah. Very good. So uh, really not a lot of pain no. and good results and it's safe. Absolutely. Very good. 
Now, we all enjoy soaking up the sunshine, but at what point does the sun or a tanning bed become too dangerous for our skin? Dr. Lisa Chips tells us more. When is too much sun too much? I mean, some of it is vitamin D, it's good for us, but when does it become too much? Well, as we get older, we all see the effects of aging on our skin. Right. But most patients, when we look at them, you can see the difference between sun-exposed skin and not sun-exposed skin. And even at an early age, if you look at somebody's uncovered areas versus their covered areas, you can see the effects of the sun on the skin. What, what kind so, of things? How does it look different? Um, the sun-exposed skin is darker. Okay. It's going to have uneven pigmentation. It's going to have uneven blood vessels or red splotches to it. It will probably have more moles, more brown spots that patients dislike, more wrinkles, all of those things. The sun has two kinds of ultraviolet radiation. There's UVA okay. and UVB. UVA is uh, radiation that comes through our window glass and the sunscreen doesn't always protect us from. Okay. And UVA contributes to aging and mm. a lot of the aging signs, the wrinkles and the sunspots and the brown spots on the skin. And chronic low-dose UVA radiation also contributes to some skin cancers, okay. whereas UVB causes the sun burns, and that also contributes to other kinds of skin cancers. Um, so they both are harmful in, in their own way. Um, so it's not just the sunburns that matter, but the chronic, everyday, low-grade sun exposure can contribute to squamous cell carcinoma and other malignancies of the skin. So is it ever okay to sit out in the sun, to enjoy the sun, or is it something you really should not do without some kind of a sunscreen on? We should all be cautious, especially in Southern California. Right. <laughs> we yeah. should all be cautious of the sun. We're getting plenty of sun just going day to day, you know, on the freeway and to the markets and to our appointments and to work we're getting enough sun to get vitamin D. For those who are deficient, we recommend supplements of vitamin D, not going to the sun for your source of vitamin D. Um, and most fair skin people especially should be wearing a sunscreen every day um, to protect against those harmful rays. I heard once that if you are somebody who has been out in the sun and, and you burn your skin, that years later that is so much worse than just getting regular doses of the sun. That's why I was asking about the burning factor. So sunburns increase the risk of basal cell carcinoma okay. and melanoma. Mm -hmm. And the chronic low dose sun exposure we believe contributes more to squamous cell carcinoma. Okay. But all three are bad. Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's go right to the tanning bed question here okay. because we read so much about mm -hmm. tanning beds, how bad they are for your skin. Um, sometimes you read things that say they're safe, especially if you go to a salon, they're good for your skin, they're better than the sun. W what is it that's damaging about the tanning bed and how does that all work? Tanning bed is pure ultraviolet radiation. So it's the worst rays of the sun all packed into one unit. Okay. Um, so it takes a lot less time in a tanning bed to right. get the sun damage to your skin. Um, a tan is your skin's reflex saying that it's damaged, that you have damage to the skin. So a tan is a reflex of your skin to um, indicate that it's time to back off of ultraviolet radiation. So tan is actually not healthy. Yeah. <laughs> for Even your though skin. We, we think we feel healthier sure. if we're a little tan, but mm -hmm. Um, how did they get approved to be on the market? I know there's a couple of states that are trying to get them banned now. I don't know what the approval process is. Okay. That's not my area of expertise. Almost all of the states in the union at this point have banned tanning for minors okay. at different cutoffs, 16, 18 years old, because we know that these are harmful, just as cigarettes have been banned for minors. You know, we know that cigarettes contribute to lung cancer. Tanning beds do contribute to skin cancer. Okay, so I'm going to ask you for the rest of us that want to be a little yes. tan, tanning mm -hmm. lotions, tanning mm -hmm. sprays, tanning towels, good things? Those are all fine, yes. Okay, so there's nothing in them that could maybe damage the skin or no. be bad for your skin afterward? No, those are all fine. Fine. Oh, okay, mm -hmm. that's a good thing because yes. I think everybody wants some kind of an alternative then. Right, right. Okay. Yeah. Let's talk about moles now because okay. um, I know that sometimes people look at their skin, they'll see something and they think, oh, is, is that a strange thing or is that a normal freckle? Mm -hmm. What are we looking for, especially as we're getting older? So we teach all of our patients to look for the A, B, C, D, E when they're looking at moles. Okay. A is for asymmetry. Any mole that's asymmetrical, that doesn't look the same as on one side as the other, should be checked. Okay. B is for borders. Anything with irregular borders, such as scalloped edges or little extensions coming off of it, needs to be examined. C is for color. Most abnormal moles have multiple colors to them. So if you see darker shades of brown, lighter shades of brown, black, white, red, blue in a mole, then that should be checked. 
Um, D is for diameter, anything bigger than a pencil eraser or six millimeters. Um, and E is for evolution. If you're seeing changes in the asymmetry, the borders, the color, or the diameter of a mole, then you need to see a board certified dermatologist and have those moles examined. When you have patients specifically that have these over a period of time, mm -hmm. um, do you take pictures of them and then you yes. can sort of look at them over, Absolutely. over time? Um, Absolutely. How do we get freckles and moles? How does that sort of happen? Mm -hmm. We don't know. Okay, <laughs> interesting. Okay. Um, there are ongoing studies. There's a study now at the University of Colorado where they're counting moles in children every year. Okay. And they're finding a correlation of, between sun exposure and the number of moles. So part of it we know is from childhood and from okay. childhood sun exposure. Um, part of it's genetic. You know, there's a good genetic component to moles. So. Some of that you can control and some of it you can't. Interesting because I, I know for a lot of people, you, like, you know, you'll know you just see something or maybe mm -hmm. even a splotchy area or discoloration. Right. Is it the same thing with discolorations or how does that work? Um, discolorations occur with sun damage and some of them are, are not bad for you and some of them are. So again, if you have a new discoloration on your skin, you should see a dermatologist. There are great resources available online for okay. patients. Mm -hmm. The American Academy of Dermatology has good patient resources. The Skin Cancer Foundation at skincancer.org okay. also has a lot of resources for patients. Mm -hmm. And if you've been diagnosed with a skin cancer, then the Mohs College um, has a website or the American Society for Dermatologic Surgery. Yeah, you, know, that, you just brought up an interesting point I wanted to, to touch on. Some people Google everything. Sure. And they want to <laughs> Google, I mean, anything that's wrong with you. Is that safe to do when you're looking at moles and things like that? Or really, you just need to go to the doctor? You need to go to the doctor. Okay. Yes. <laughs> it's good to educate yourself and yeah. to visit these reputable websites to, to learn about what to look for. Okay. But when it comes to a specific lesion, patients shouldn't be self-diagnosing. They should see an experienced dermatologist who can decide whether a biopsy is warranted or not. Yeah, I think that I'd rather take your schooling than Dr. Google any day of the week. <laughs> oh, thank so you. I think that's a lot better. How does skin cancer directly occur? How does it happen? Well, there's damage to the keratinocytes, which are the skin cells that make up the different layers of the skin. And that damage comes from ultraviolet radiation primarily. Okay. Um, when those cells are damaged, they start to proliferate and try to make more of themselves. And when you have too many of those damaged cells, then that's a skin cancer. And that's true for most of the non-melanoma skin cancers, like basal cell and squamous cell carcinoma. Okay. Melanoma is a little bit different because it originates with the pigment cells of the skin instead of the, the regular skin cells. And so part of that is genetic, and a part of it is, again, from sun damage and ultraviolet damage to the DNA of those cells. We hope that you've learned how important it is to take care of your skin. Remember, your skin stays with you forever, so learn how to take care of it for a lifetime. I'm Maria Sorreo, and we'll see you next time around the peninsula.